My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this afternoon the portion of scripture for our consideration is our first lesson from the book of Amos chapter 8. The prophet Amos had been given an unpleasant job. He was to be the Lord's messenger to the northern kingdom of Israel around the last generation before they are destroyed. And as you might imagine, given the timing there, the message he has for them is not sunshine and rainbows. It is a lot of the Lord condemning. Condemning the nation for the idolatry and wickedness condemning the nation for following the nations surrounding them in pursuing evil and wickedness, and condemning the nation for their lack of love for the Lord, and in losing their love for Him, losing their love for each other as well. In the portion of Scripture for our consideration, he is addressing the rich people in the nation of Israel, those who have wealth and power and have made it their God. He is addressing those who have stopped viewing the poor and needy around them as brothers and sisters and view them only as people to extract wealth from. Instead of the Lord's golden rule of loving your neighbor as you love yourself, they have made a new golden rule of take whatever you can from whoever you can take it from. And so the Lord's message to them is this. He says, Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? Skimping on the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. The Lord had given Israel quite a number of rules and regulations on how they were to treat the poor. And overall, it was to be with kindness and compassion. It included things like when you harvest a field, you cannot glean every last bit of grain to harvest there. You have to leave some of it so that those can go and get something to eat. Or if someone is poor and in need and they need to take out a loan to feed themselves, you could not take and keep the things they needed for, for life on collateral. You could not take someone's cloak or their coat. You had to return it to them at the end of the day, whether they had repaid you or not. Overall, the Lord said to his people, if your brother comes to you in need with an open hand, treat him with kindness and compassion as the Lord has treated you. But the people in Israel had abandoned all of that. Now, their true God is money. And they would do anything to get it more, including and especially oppressing and crushing the people least able to fight back. The poor, the needy, 
those who already have so very little became prey for those who had so very much. And yet, what they had wasn't enough. It wasn't enough just to keep what was theirs and not share it. They needed to steal it. The grain that the poor would buy, it would be measured in a basket. And instead of being the full measure, the basket would be built to cheat. So that the amount of grain is lighter than it should be. But that wasn't extracting enough wealth out of the poor. So they cheated on the scales. So that when the poor person would put the little silver they had on the scale to purchase that wheat, the amounts wouldn't measure up right. They would need to pile on more than they were told they needed to put on. And even that wasn't enough to satiate the greed. They would sweep in the dust and the useless parts of the harvest together with the wheat and sell it as good grain even though significant portions of it were trash and steal from the people that way. And when finally the people who are poor had nothing left They would take the things they needed to, li to live. Here it's referenced a pair of sandals. On loan for the day's food. And then when they could not afford to pay back even that pittance of a loan to get their sandals back, they would take the poor and sell them into slavery and profit one last time off of that debt. The greed on display is appalling, right? And yet, the most appalling part of it all is the people who are doing this claim to be pious as they did it. They would close down their shops for the new moon festival and the Sabbath days, like the law said. Lord, the way we should be, not doing business when we shouldn't be doing business. Yet all the while under their thin veneer of love for God, there is only the hunger of insatiable greed, the desire for this festival or the Sabbath to be over so they can extort just that much more out of the helpless around them. This is what Jesus means when he talks in our gospel about you cannot serve two masters. The people of Israel in Amos' day had chosen their master. It was wealth. They had lost their love for the Lord and lost their love for their neighbors too. And so it is to these people that the Lord utters perhaps the most bone-chilling statement in all of Scripture. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob I will never forget anything they have done. The Lord swears that he will remember this sin, that he will not forget, he will not forgive. Because they have rejected the Lord, rejected their neighbors, betrayed the covenant, There is only God's wrath, which will burn against them forever. 
he decrees they are going to hell. It's a frightening thought. And as we gather here today and we have these words in front of us to reflect on, we should take them very seriously. Who is the master of our heart? I would certainly hope we have not fallen to the gross oppression of the poor that we see on display here. But are our hearts and minds truly filled with the love for God that they should have, which means love for our neighbors around us too? rich and poor alike? Are we filled with compassion and concern the way God has compassion and concern for us? Or is our focus selfish, self-centered? Are our thoughts, words, and actions, is our behavior in dealing with others behavior that reaches out to those who come to us with op outstretched hands with compa compassion and kindness? Or is our first response to reject and refuse, to cling very, very tightly to what we have because we dare not lose it? My brothers and sisters, If you see this specter of greed has clouded your heart, then you need to repent, just as I need to repent. The love of money and possessions at the expense of God and our neighbor, it is built into the very fabric of our society, right? Money and power and wealth are valued above all else. That thinking, it creeps into the hearts of God's people too. But thanks be to our God that he is merciful. First of all, we're not in the northern kingdom of Israel. The Lord's message about never forgetting, it thankfully was not spoken to you and me. No, to us, the Lord spent, sent a different message. A message of forgiveness borne by his son. The Lord sent us Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice to pay for our sin. He sent Jesus to take away the guilt of greed and the love and idolatry of our hearts and our thoughts and our words. He sent his son to be our substitute and to love us and our neighbors the way we have never loved them. And in Christ, he takes away our guilt. He removes our iniquity and our sin so that God does not remember them. It's not that they are forgotten, they are paid for. They are no longer credited against us because Jesus took them on his account. That is the only way we can approach our God. The only way we can serve the true master is through Jesus. He came as the savior of the world, the lost who deserved being sentenced to hell. Our sins 
are truly no less egregious than those of the peoples that came before us. But our Lord gives us this time of grace here on earth to learn of his love and to trust him. To turn from our sin and turn to our Savior. He calls all of us to repentance, which is why we confess our sins at the start of just about every worship service. Our Lord came to us with kindness and compassion that abounds and flows even still. And his mercy to us takes away every single sin. He instead makes us his family, makes us the heirs of eternal life, remembers our wickedness no more, sees only righteousness and holiness won and given to us by Jesus. With a God who loves us that much, who seeks and saves the lost in that way, our response can and must be to thank and praise, to serve and obey him, to love our God who loved us first. And if we're going to love our God, we have to love our neighbor too. If we are going to thank our God for what he has done, we have to show his compassion and kindness that he showed to us, to the people around us who need it. The overflowing love that our Lord pours into our hearts should be on our lips and in our minds and in our actions. As we deal with the people around us, who desperately need our help. So my brothers and sisters, as we go about our weeks, we come to our Lord only through Jesus, only through the Savior. And as we strive to grow in love for him who loved us first, let us also love our neighbor, as that is our Lord's command, to serve God means to have compassion and kindness to the poor, the needy, to everyone that we deal with. We love these people because God has loved us. Amen.